Ladies and gentlemen, this is American Naval Officer Rear Admiral Richard Evan on board. Born October 1888 in Winchester, Virginia, United States. His service in the Navy would see him awarded the Medal of Honor, the Navy Cross, Navy Distinguished Service Medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, Legion of Merit and the Congressional Gold Medal. From 1926 to 1956, Admiral Board had a number of expeditions to both the North and South Poles of the Earth. These expeditions have always been shrouded in controversy due to the distance travelled and the reported observed phenomenon. During these expeditions beyond both poles, this man claimed he was flying over land free of ice and snow, comprising of mountains, rivers, lakes and forests. This land extended for thousands of miles beyond each geographical pole point, forcing the Admiral into a 180 degree turn to retrace his path back to familiar surroundings. During Operation High Jump, which was undertaken in 1947, a large US naval fleet had to cut the expedition short after supposedly coming under heavy fire from flying vehicles that did not resemble any known aircraft of the time. So, with claims of UFOs, land free of ice and snow, and stretching as far as the eyes can see beyond both pole points, the Antarctic Treaty was established in 1959 which restricted independent exploration, allowing only supervised trips to specific locations. Aired on December the 8th, 1954, this episode of the Longines Chronoscope features Admiral Bo talking about places of discovery on the Earth. And Friday, a presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, Distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur, CBS News correspondent. Please pay attention to the body Kenneth language, Crawford, facial expressions, and the new week magazine. Of the host, Larry very Lasseur. Guest for this what this man is about to say Richard clearly e. makes him uncomfortable. He's Good live on TV no and keeps land, looking down and away from when... the camera. By buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. You know, only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. So, according to this man, there's no discoveries to be made in the North because it's getting crowded up there. Not only is it nice to live there, it's strategically important from a military perspective. And remember, this one of the coldest locations on the earth. Left in the world today, an area is as for the South Pole, States, he says that's there's never a continent the size beings. of the United States and down there, the like the North, the free of ice and pole. snow. He from said it had never been seen by a human being. It's, uh, this I untouched it's land was rich in resources with vast quantities be an that could supply that humanity for hundreds of years. I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. With a distance of thousands of miles beyond the poles traversed, while remaining within the same layer of atmosphere over land that doesn't appear or cannot be placed on any map of a globe or solid sphere, simply put, to go beyond the pole point on a globe for thousands of miles, observing mountains, forests, green vegetation, rivers and lakes, at two of the coldest locations on the earth that should be covered with massive sheets of ice, without a doubt calls into question the very dimensions and shape of this world. The two authors above came to the same conclusions in relation to the hollow earth based on the conditions observed at the poles. 
with other accounts of people sailing beyond the known boundaries of the earth. The hollow earth concept seems logical as that is the only way to go beyond the pole point on a sphere. These men understood that the documented observations made in the polar regions, especially the Arctic, indicated the possibility of the existence of land within close proximity to the pole. You simply cannot have a warm wind magically manifest itself at one of the coldest locations on the earth. But look folks, I'm not here to talk about the hollow earth concept. I've read over the material from that perspective for years, as I'm sure you have. So I know how all the different claims and associated observations fit together and basically work. So I'd like to use that same material, but show it to you from a completely different cosmic perspective. So this book was published by Francis Amelio Giannini in 1959. It's based on what I can only deem to be some type of extrasensory perception, astral projection or remote viewing type experience. He did not venture to the poles in the physical in which first hand observations were obtained. Instead, he uses the claims made by Admiral Board as his main proof for his physical continuum concept and that's simply based on distance. Now I've gone a little further than just Admiral Board. This book allowed me to look at a number of subjects and other observed phenomena from a completely new perspective. My goal here is to just share that newly acquired perspective with others who read the book and can share their own insights to help further understand this particular cosmological concept. So these are the images provided by the author to help the reader in his or her understanding of the concepts being described in the book. Figure 1 showing the universe whole and how it must deceptively appear. To me it's shown a concave system environment, one governed by magnetism. To me it's depicting the cosmic egg. The world egg, cosmic egg or mundane egg is a mythological motif found in the cosmogonies of many cultures that is present in the Proto-Indo-European cultures and other cultures and civilizations. Typically, the world egg is a beginning of some sort and the universe or some primordial being comes into existing existence by hatching from the egg, sometimes laying on the primordial waters of the earth. Figure 3 showing a side view of the universe whole, comprised of two planes that run parallel to each other. The terrestrial plane which the earth is on and the celestial plane which is above us. These two planes comprise the shell of the cosmic egg, as above so below. Each plane has a limited ceiling or altitude, a magnetic barrier or firmament runs parallel to all land within the structure. This magnetic barrier creates a cavity in which the pressurized atmosphere is contained and separated from the stratosphere ether or void, the space in between the two planes that contains the sun. The term axis mundi, also called the cosmic axis, world axis, world pillar, center of the world or world tree, refer to any mythological concept representing the connection between heaven and earth or the higher and lower realms. So in 1885, William F. Warren published his book Paradise Found, focusing on the Arctic region and using practically every bit of literature known to man, he concludes that the ancestral home of the human race was at the North Pole. This ancestral land or the Miocene continent would now be submerged under the Arctic Ocean. On page 240 it states, Yet this testimony stands not alone, for in the fragment of another ancient text, translated by Sayas in records of the past, we are told of a dwelling which the gods created for the first human beings, a dwelling in which they became great and increased in numbers, and the location of which 
is describe the modes exactly corresponding to those of Iranian, Indian, Chinese, Idaic and Aztec literature, namely in the centre of the earth. In these images you can see how the filament or buttress mountains have been placed in the four cardinal directions surrounding Mount Maru but on the same linear plane as the Golden Mountain. Itadasil is the mighty tree whose trunk rises at the geographical centre of the North spiritual cosmos. The rest of that cosmos, including the nine walls, is arrayed around it and held together by its branches and roots, which connect the various parts of the cosmos to one another. Asgard is one of the nine walls of the Norse mythology and the home and fortress of the Azir, one of the two tribes of gods, the other being the Vanir, who have a, their home in Vanaheim. In addition to the, to the inhabitants of the nine worlds, several beings live in, on and under the tree itself. It is said that the god Odin would ride his eight-legged horse Slipnir up and down Yadrasil's trunk and across its many branches on his frequent journeys throughout the universe. Asgard, therefore, is a city located in the sky and is connected to Midgard, the world of humanity. To the ancient Greeks, Hyperborea was a mysterious land of perpetual sun and eternal spring said to be located beyond the north wind. Its peoples were a blessed, long-lived race, untouched by war, hard toil or the ravages of old age and disease. It was ruled by a race of joint kings known as Boreids. Some theories postulate Hyperborea was the original Garden of Eden, the point where the earthly and the heavenly planes meet. According to certain esoteric systems and spiritual traditions, Hyperborea was the terrestrial and celestial beginning of civilization, the home of original man. Here the gods walk with man in a perfect and harmonious environment, balanced between the terrestrial and celestial planes. Humanity suffered no sickness and no aging in this timeless paradise. It was the land of eternal summer and favourite home of Apollo, located far beyond the north wind. In Buddhism, Mount Maru is the centre of all the physical, metaphysical and spiritual universe. The mountain is said to be 84,000 Johannes high. The world extends around Mount Maru. Above the peak is the realm of the Buddha fields or heavens. On the upper slopes you find the gods. The titans live on the lower slopes, animals and humans live on the plains around the mountain, hungry ghosts live on or just below the surface. All this is surrounded by the great ocean. In Hindu mythology, Mount Maru is the mythical mountain at the centre of the world where Indra, king of the gods, resides. An ancient mountain and mythical centre of the universe on which was situated the city of Brahma. Becoming jealous of Maru, the Vindhya began to grow very high obstructing the sun, the moon and the planets. Agastya, whom the Vindhya mountain respected, asked it to stop growing until he crossed it on his way to the south and returned to the north again, but he did not return at all, having settled in the south. In the Bhagavad Gita, the warrior princess Arjuna is said to have travelled to Shambhala in the far north in search of enlightenment. He is said to have found the mysterious land known as Uttarakuru, that blissful land of the sages with magic fruit trees that yielded the nectar of immortality. This land he wandered upon was one of the four regions surrounding Mount Maru, the northern homeland of the Cedars, enlightened yogis famed for their miraculous powers. To the Celtics, it was known as the mystical Avalon, the great sea girt island in the waters of the north. It could of course be reached only by ship. Hidden in the mists of illusion, once our home, now mostly forgotten except in our dreams. Our soul still goes there for healing and revitalization. It is the land without time, full of power and mystery, offering enlightenment to the traveler 
that is fortunate enough to enter its gates. Hebrew legends speak of a place called Luz, which is described as a sunken city near a sacred mountain called the abode of immortality. From the Talmud, there is an upper and lower paradise, and in between them, upright is fixed a pillar, and by this they are joined together, and it is called the strength of the hill of Sion. And by this pillar, on every Sabbath and festival, the righteous climb up and feed themselves with a glance at the divine majesty till the end of the Sabbath or festival when they slide down and return into the lower paradise. To the people of Tibet and Mongolia, believe that Shambhala is a hidden kingdom far beyond the northern mountains, with a community where perfect and semi-perfect beings live, guiding the evolution of mankind. Its summit aligns to the wheeling constellation of Ursa Major, the seven stars that circle the Arctic North Pole. The Egyptians, Akkadians and Indians believe that Maru has its opposite. The North Polar Arctic Maru, known as Mount Sumeru, is the dwelling place of the gods, and the South Polar Antarctic Maru, known as Mount Kumaru, is the dwelling place of demons. Maru, the Olympus of the Indians, is said to be situated in the centre of the earth. It is guarded by serpents or energy, which watch the entrance to the realms of secret knowledge. It is the land of bliss of the earliest Vedic times. The Egyptians located their Ta Natur, or land of the gods in the extreme north. Quote taken from Paradise Found, quoting Bruges, confessedly the foremost authority in ancient Egyptian geography, placed the highest and most sacred part of the Egyptians earth at the north, making the land there to rise until actual contact with heaven. He also places at the farthest southern extremity of the earth another lofty mountain, Captain 2 or Captain 2, literally the horn of the wolf. In Iranian mythology, we find in Zoroastrian text the following From Mount Harbors, everything that takes place in the world is seen. Mount Daria is in the centre of the world, the sun turns around it. Like waters washing the bar land of Mount Harbors, the sun revolves around Mount Daria. Furthermore, firstly, Mount Harbors grew up 15 years. After 800 years, it grew completely. It took 200 years to grow to the circle of the stars, 200 years to the circle of the moon, 200 years to the circle of the sun, and 200 years to the primordial light. Mount Harbors is attached to heaven around this earth, and Harbors is the place where the stars, the moon, and the sun set. To the Chinese, Shang Tei's heavenly palace, which they declared to be in the pole star, was also referred to as the Palace of the Center. The ancient Chinese referred to the Axis Mundi as Mount Kunlun, with a bronze pillar of heaven at the summit where the immortals dwell. According to their beliefs, it is possible to go through it to the highest lands of the universe. It was considered to be something like paradise. One ancient text describes it as follows. The one who would go up from Kunlun twice as high would reach the mountain of cool wind and gain immortality. The one who would go up twice as high will, will reach the hanging ground and gain miraculous abilities. Having learned to manage the wind and the rain, the one who would go up twice as high will reach the heaven, the abode of Tai Di, the Supreme Lord, and will become a spirit. The Japanese also have a Shambhala, which they have named Island of the Congealed Drop. It is situated at the centre of the earth. Its first roof pillar was the earth's axis or magnetic mountain, and over it was the pivot of the vault of heaven, Polaris. Oriental tradition is ever referring to an unknown northern glacier, gloomy sea and dark region that leads to the fortunate islands and the fountain of life. 
Indians believed Mount Maru was in the north, in the region of darkness and snow, where stars, the moon and the sun revolve. A common plot of many myths and legends was the description of the magic abode behind the sacred mountains, the so-called land of blissful, situated on the northern slope of Mount Maru, on the shore of the Milky Ocean, the sea, the Arctic Ocean. A similar image was known to the Altaians, who believed that the golden cosmic mountain, Altin II, was attached to the heaven and hung over the earth, not reaching the earth by a minimal distance of the length of a human chin. However, most traditionally, Maru was depicted as a round or tetrahedral mountain, gradually narrowing towards its top. Altoi Tatars imagined Bay Ulgen sitting amidst the heaven on a golden mountain. Abakan Tatars call it the Iron Mountain. Mongols, Briliots and Kalmyks know it as Sambor, Samor or Sumeru. In Central Asian traditions and for many Altoi peoples, the World Mountain, based on the image of Mount Maru, is often represented as an iron pillar, the Iron Mountain, located in the middle of the earthly disk and joining heaven and earth with its top touching the pole star. Sometimes the mountain stands on the navel of a turtle turned to its side, on each leg of which a particular continent is located. According to other versions, the pole star itself is the edge of God's palace built on top of the mountain. Kalmyks believe that stars revolve around Mount Sumeru. According to myths of some Altoi peoples, 33 Tengri live on top of the mountain. There is a myth saying that Sumeru was three times surrounded by the enormous serpent of Losum. Mongols and Kalmyks believe the world mountain has three or four tiers. For Siberian Tatars, the mountain has seven tiers. In their mystic journeys, Yakut shamans also ascend a seven-tier mountain. Its top rests against the pole star, the navel of heaven. Bariats say the pole star is attached to the mountain top. In Persia, the teachings of the Alistan, the term, refers to the cradle land of the Aryan Iranians. It is supposed to be located not in any of Earth's seven climates, but within an eight climate at the center of the central zone of the earth. The tribesmen and peoples of the Persian and the Caucasus mountains will maintain to this day that far beyond the snow-capped summits of Cap or Caucasus, there is a great continent now concealed from all. In Avistan cosmogony, Mount Hara is the geographic center of the universe. The pinnacle of Mount Hara is Mount Hokaria, translated as of good activity in the Ost, a collection of 21 Zoroastrian hymns. From Hara springs the source of all waters of the world. These waters rush down from the mountain as the mighty world river, translated as fertile, powerful, spotless, which in turn feed the great sea upon which the world rests. Biblical texts give a ground to state that paradise is also located on a mountain. According to the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden was in the east, but Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13 specified it was on a mountain in the north. To all appearances, paradise is identified with the sacred large mountain mentioned in Palms 23 p 235 with a note that only a righteous person with innocent hands and pure heart may ascend it. In Indonesia, to the Kawi or all Javanese speaking people, this mythical mountain of gods was mentioned in Tantu Pergal Arlen, an old Javanese manuscript written in the Kawi language from the 15th century. The manuscript describes the mythical origin of Java Island and the legend of the movement of portions of Mount Maru to Java. The manuscript explained that Bhattarara Guru Shiva ordered the god Brahma and Vishnu to fill the Java island with human beings. 
However, at that time Java Island was floating freely on the ocean, always tumbling and shaking. To stop the island's movement, the gods decided to nail it to the earth by moving part of Maha Meru in Jambu Dipfa and attaching it to Java. The resulting mountain is Mount Sumeru, the tallest mountain on Java. In archaic shaman religions, Yakut Nitz devoted much attention to the miraculous tree al Yukmas. Legends say the tree sheds the life-giving moisture that gives cheerfulness and extra force to those who drink it. Once upon a time this tree intended to germinate to the heavenly land of higher spirits in order to destroy them, but eventually it rejected the sacrilegious idea and turned into a tethering post for the heavenly beings after it reached the heaven. Over time, having decided to reach to the underworld and destroy lower spirits, the tree changed its mind again and its roots started serving as a hanger for the underworld beings. Stretching high upwards and deep downwards, al Mass represents a steadfast core of the universe. For the ancient Slavs, the world centre was the world tree. It is the central axis of the whole universe, including the earth, which joins the world of people with the world of gods and the underworld. The tree crown reaches the world of gods in the heaven. The roots stretch underground and join the world of gods and the world of people within the underworld, or the world of the dead. Somewhere aloft above the clouds, the heavenly abyss, the seven sky, the crown of the branchy tree forms an island, where exactly the Slavic paradise is situated inhabited not only by gods and human forefathers but by ancestors of, of all birds and animals too. Thus, the world tree used to be a fundamental concept, a major component of the Slavic worldview. At the same time, it represented a ladder or road that could take one to any of the worlds. The Chinese world tree, known as Qin Mu, the erect tree or Jin Mu, the builder tree rises at the world centre. The trunk of the tree has branches up to a height of a thousand feet, where nine big intertwined branches protrude. At the base of the trunk, nine big intertwined roots plunge into the ground. Its branches support the nine heavens, and its roots draw from the nine sources. The nine branches and nine heavens are linked to the nine roots and nine sources by the trunk of the tree. The central branch and root constitute an extension of the trunk and together symbolise the world axis, the communication channel between earth and heaven, between ascending terrestrial influences and descending celestial influences. A quote taken from Moses in the Quran, page 98. Beyond this earth God created a sea surrounding it. Then he created, beyond that sea, a mountain which is called Kaf. The heavens of this world are supported by it. Then, beyond that mountain, he created an earth like this earth seven times. He created, beyond that earth, a sea which surrounds it. And he created, beyond that, a mountain which is called Kaf, supporting the second heaven, until the number of earths, seas, mountains and heavens reached seven. This is the word of God, and the sea stretched behind it for seven seas. Kaf is the mountain that links each of the earths to each of the heavens. Taken from the Indo-Chinese Gleaner, page 40. The mighty Jehovah shed forth a light towards the yet unformed earth. This light melted and became the watery abyss, the sea, vast and unlimited. He next glanced on the watery expanse and foam and smoke ascended. The sea was formed with seven stories each one of which is removed from another, the distance of a journey of 500 years. In like manner was the earth also formed with seven stories. He then spread out the earth upon the ocean, from the place where the sun rises to the place where he goes down. But the centre of the earth was yet tremulous, being agitated by the divine billows of the deep and wide sea. The mighty Jehovah created the mountain Kof to consolidate the earth to encircle it and to ward off from it the divine billows of the vast abyss. From the rough veins of Kof sprang up multitudes of other mountains, high and large, which rendered the earth immovable. Beyond the boundaries of Kof, 
is a vast space 70 times as large as the world. I can go on, but it's just more of the same. Even the masons use them in their temple depictions. It's clear to me that the same location and structure is being described here. We have seven earths, seven seas, seven mountains and seven heavens and all linked by the mighty Mount Kaf. Just like the seven locusts, the seven dipfus and the seven rishis comprise Mount Maru of the Vedas. Just as in Norse cosmology, Idrasil is a representation of the known cosmos. It represents the nine worlds. Seven of those are on the trunk itself, or as previously described, on the side of a turtle's leg, while the roots and branches represent the other two. It represents the three planes of existence. This is reality. It is truth stranger than any fiction the world has known. There is no physical end to the Earth's northern and southern extent. The Earth merges with land areas of the universe about us that exist straight ahead beyond the North Pole and South Pole points of theory. It is now established that we may at once journey into celestial land areas by customary movement on the horizontal from beyond the pole points. It is also known that the flight course from this Earth to connect the land area of the universe about us which appears up or out from the earth will always be over land and water and vegetation common to this earth area of the universe whole. Never need we shoot up as popular misconception demands to reach celestial land existing under every luminous area we observe at night. On the contrary, we will move straight ahead on the same physical level from either of theory's imaginary power points. The relative relationship of up is by no means an innovation by this writer. It has always been known, in spite of the fact that the understanding has not always been afforded practical application. Up is always relative to the position we hold anywhere in the universe structure. When we stand on the land up there, this terrestrial land we have left behind will have to appear to be up to our observation from a celestial area. The fly standing on the ceiling of or the floor is as much up from either position, nor is the fly upside down when standing on the ceiling. Our concept of values may consider the fly on the ceiling to be upside down, but it can in no way affect the fly's position. The fly stands as firmly on the ceiling as on the floor. In a nutshell, Mr. Giannini states that the earth merges with what has been documented throughout human history as being either mountains, trees or pillars located at both the northern and southern geographical pole points. By simply moving in a northern or southern direction on the horizontal, by either using your feet, ice permitting, a boat, ice permitting, a balloon, airship, dirigible, blimp, plane or something a little more exotic like a Vimana or UFO will give one access to what is essentially the continuation of the physically connected universe. This following quote is quite important in terms of understanding what these structures actually are. This manuscript mentions that Mount Maru lies in the middle of the earth, Jambu Dipva, and a 9th century text based on mostly unpublished text of Yamal Tantor mentions that Sumeru is heard to be in the middle of the earth but it is not seen there. Now what I actually think it's telling us is that these structures cannot be seen as they are part and parcel of the universe whole. As I said at the start, the atmosphere has a limited ceiling so you cannot gain enough altitude or distance from it to see it as a physical part of the cosmos. One only knows he has reached it when you come across the buttress of filament mountains, each on the four sides of Maru. The Eight Pillars, also known as 
Eight Pillars of the Sky, a concept from Chinese mythology. Located in the eight cardinal directions, they are a group of eight mountains or pillars which have been taught to hold up the sky. They are symbolically important as types of access money and cosmology. Their function in mythology ranged from pillars which functioned to hold apart the earth and the sky or heaven, as ladders allowing travel between the two, and as the location of various paradises or wonderland with associated magical people, plants and animals. This is Eric Dollard. Listen to this chapter describing the sun. Now obviously it's in relation to the heliocentric model, but that's neither here nor there. The sun and its effects on the atmosphere take place no matter what the shape of the earth is. But we're not here trying to claim or make statements of fact. But his description differs greatly from how our education would have us perceive it and seems to me to support the, the Nikola Tesla statement in relation to the universe being governed by magnetism, by resonance. So I was the guy with the equipment and everything right there as the thing happened. I studied the whole event over the couple of years that the whole solar cycle built into this alignment. There's no inside structure. Is it hollow? Yeah, there's only a surface. There's nothing inside. Is the sun actually the way of combusting it out? It's not burning anything. There's no fusion in the sun. That's well understood. Yeah, well, there's just not the way to prove that there isn't. It's only in the flares that you get fusion. That's where all the X-rays. Flares, the arcs, and the X-rays, and the microwaves, and whatever result of fusion in the arcs. It's, there's no fusion in the sun. They don't know how the sun works. What's, what, how does the sun make light? Well, it's a transform. It transforms from some other dimension. It's not burning anything. It doesn't have to. A converter. I don't know. Nobody knows. But that's what it does. That's the only thing it can do because that's how everything works. Yeah, you can say it's taking energy from another dimension, counter space. There, I mean, there's no energy actually. You can't. Most of it you can't even measure in outer space or see. No, you can't see the sun in free space. The sun is not visible. Not in free space. It's only invisible when gross matter becomes involved, like the Earth's atmosphere and envelope and the surface of the moon or whatever, that makes the light. Otherwise there is no light. You can see the moon, you can see the Earth, but you can't see the sun and you can't see the stars. Yeah, right. You can see material objects, but you cannot see the sources of light. There is no light, so there's a material object. So that means there's no time delay. So the whole time delay thing is, is meaningless doesn't take light years. There are no light years, because there's no light. So that, does, that means that the light you see from the distant stars isn't four million years old. It could be only minutes old. It could be instantaneous. All the theories collapse when you can't see the stars in outer space. So as he said, the sun is not visible in free space. Only when the magnetic dispensation from the sun strikes gross matter which is basically our atmosphere or material objects is visible light actually created. So if gross matter is needed for us to see visible light, what are stars, galaxies, nebula or the moon? They would be a manifestation of light of plasma due to the interaction of magnetic fields. Basically, the magnetic dispensation from the sun striking the atmosphere of the celestial plane which we view from distance through our moisture rich atmosphere so the way the human eye works with lens convergence it distorts our view but from this perspective it would be plasma all the night sky all the light in the night sky is basically plasma and underneath that is a is the celestial plane. In this video, Dan Dimensions describes the effect the electromagnetic sun has on the atmosphere as it passes over the Earth. As there's only one luminary in this guy's model, the sun illuminates all around within the structure, irrespective of distance. 
So what, it's still going over the air. It's still everywhere else. But in fact, all of the noble gases glow when they are bombarded with electrons.
as you can see, I have no moon in this model. In Mr. Giannini's concept, the physical continuum concept, uh, the moon is not a physical object. It's like like everything else in the night sky. It's it's plasma. It's a manifestation manifestation of light due to the interaction of magnetic fields. Uh, if you go to YouTube and type in the moon is plasma, you'll come across a TV interview from 1965 in which a professor R. Foster was being interviewed uh, in relation to his theories about the moon, in which he he postulates that the moon is plasma and it's not something physical, it's not terra firma, something that can be landed upon. Um, now I added this into the into the fourth video but I'm not gonna put it in here because it, it puts a strike against the, the, the video for copyrighted material. But you can go to YouTube yourself there and watch it. But interestingly enough as well, uh, in our own written past, uh, we had accounts when there was inhabitants on the earth and there was no moon in the sky. Now you can pause the video here yourself and, and just read through them, them quotes there. Uh, so you have an idea of what you were saying but it, from my understanding from a heliocentric perspective that would be impossible to have humans living on the earth and, and their own moon in the sky uh, based on the theories in relation to how the moon was formed um, so again if you want to just read through them but from a cosmic egg perspective the, again the moon would be plasma like everything else in the night sky so I'll just read some of the quotes out from Mr. Giannini's book in relation to the moon. The moon would not be less moon were it universally known that area of luminosity greater than the luminosity of other celestial areas is but a reflection of, so of the sun at various angles and different periods and it will not detract from the moon and its purpose when it is known that the reflection is not cast upon an isolated moon body much closer to the earth than other celestial areas but that the reflection is in fact cast upon an area of the luminous connected celestial sky the moon has always befuddled astronomers and their associated theorists it does not fit into the man-made mechanistic pattern of the universe it continues to present itself as a celestial riddle because theorists mistakenly persist in considering it an isolated body remote from other celestial skylight areas whereas the moon represents celestial sky area where solar reflection at various angles during our calendar month accentuates the natural skylight of celestial areas in the reflections course that course is dictated by the sun's movement Hence, it is the reflection at different angles which produces for terrestrial inhabitants the spectacle commonly known as the phases of the moon. Such condition has lacked adequate explanation for many centuries and it must forever be without explanation if we continue mistakenly to construe the moonlight as indicative of an isolated body. The moon of our observation is most definitely not a body of any nature unless we wish to consider it a body of celestial skylight holding the additional light of solar reflection. In a realistic view of the universe whole, it represents only an isolated celestial skylight condition and the isolated condition is produced by the only truly isolated body in the entire creation that is the sun. Thus, through that sun's reflection on the gaseous and moving celestial skylight, there is developed light shadings, conveniently described as the man on the moon. The shadings do not represent anything on the celestial land surface underlying the dual luminosity of natural celestial skylight intensified by solar reflection. They are sole products of light existing in celestial sky area over the celestial land. The Cosmic Egg A universal concave system environment governed by magnetism. Every being and creature within it breathing oxygen as this layer of atmosphere covers all land 
and varies in atmospheric density depending on the location within the universal structure and the distance that land is from the sun. In 1954, German physicist and professor W. O. Schumann hypothesized there were measurable electromagnetic waves in the atmosphere that existed in the cavity or space between the surface of the Earth and the ionosphere. In 1954, Schumann and H. L. Connick confirmed Schumann's hypothesis by detecting resonances at a main frequency of 7.83 Hz, which was established by measuring electromagnetic resonances generated and excited by lightning discharges in the ionosphere. So this resonance frequency of 7.83 Hz happens to be a very powerful frequency when used with brainwave entrainment and it's associated uh, with low levels of alpha and the upper range of theta brainwave states. So the earth is basically a huge magnet and the human mind dances to the same tune as the earth. Not just us though, practically every little thing, living thing on this earth has a magnetic signature and is in a constant state of vibration, as is everything, because that's how Nikola Tesla said it all operates. But there's a couple of accounts, folks, in which people claim to have sailed beyond the North Pole of the Earth, and in doing so, came across mountainous plateaus that they referred to as the magnetic land. Now this land resonated at a different frequency compared to this Earth, as it made these fortunate explorers feel revitalized. So we focus on that aspect of the North Pole in the next video. Now if you want to look up or read up on the, uh, the earth, the shape, uh, what's at the poles, Mount Maru, uh, I suggest reading the Mahabharata, uh, volume 5, um, starting uh, page 14, uh, section 6 there. It, it describes it all to me, basically that you're, you're dealing with a, a concave system environment like that. As, as Jean Ely states, it, it mer the Earth merges with these, these column-like structures at the poles, as you can see there. Like, again, I have no idea how many of these there is or where they bloody are. It would be impossible for me to know any of that. My goal here, again, is to focus on the poles in which this man states that the Earth, earth merges there with the rest of the physical universe. So again, it's just another way of looking at these, again, these mythological, mythological descriptions of the pole in relations to the mountain or a tree or a pillar. That's how they described it, but you just have to look at it as something different than that. Thanks for watching.